Hello and welcome to The Edge, where we take an in-depth analysis of today's top stories by looking beyond the edge. We'll bring you not just the facts, but also deep insights into the topics with expert opinions and social media reactions. Let's make a start with our look beyond the edge. German Chancellor Angela Merkel has defended a deal with the United States that allows the Nord Stream 2 gas pipeline to proceed as a pragmatic compromise. Ukraine says that the agreement is too weak to ensure that Russia behaves the way Kiev and the West want. Will the countries use this gas project as a political tool in the future? Taliban are gaining control of more and more territory, which the Pentagon estimates now extends to over half of Afghanistan's district centers. The Taliban are also putting pressure on the outskirts of many of the provincial capitals, trying to isolate them. Or will the security crisis endanger Afghanistan's unity? These are the top two stories that we'll be taking a look at today on this 100th episode of The Edge. Let's get started. Nord Stream 2 is a highly controversial gas pipeline project which is being used as a political tool. Our following infographic has the main facts. Ukraine's foreign minister says that the U.S.-German deal on the Russian Nord Stream pipeline has left a number of questions unanswered. Ukraine's foreign minister, Dmytro Kuleba, has reacted to Wednesday's announcement from the U.S. and Germany regarding a deal to allow the completion of a controversial Russian gas pipeline. Kuleba has said that the Ukrainian government has lots of questions regarding the agreement. The U.S.-German agreement aims to allay fears about European dependence on Russian energy. However, it was immediately assailed by critics who said it didn't go far enough. The Nord Stream 2 project has posed a major foreign policy dilemma for the Biden administration. U.S. officials from both parties have long feared that it would give Russia too much power over European gas supplies. However, the pipeline is almost completed, and the U.S. has been determined to rebuild ties with Germany that were damaged during the Trump administration. Poland and Ukraine expressed their displeasure over the decision to allow the pipeline's completion and said the efforts to reduce the Russian security threat were not sufficient. The agreement is not a clear political win for either President Joe Biden or German Chancellor Angela Merkel, an unabashed supporter of the pipeline who will step down later this year. I'm now joined live from New York in the United States by Chris Haynes, who's Associate Professor of Political Science at the University of New Haven. Chris, thank you for joining us again today here on The Edge. 
Pleasure to be back. Now, on, on the face of it, the Nord Stream 2 uh, project is, is a wonderful project because it, it brings uh, um, energy to, uh, to European countries um, and should be helping to secure the uh, energy for the region. And yet the United States uh, isn't very happy about this. Could, could, could you tell us um, about the, the project and, and why it might be a problem? Yeah, and like you said, you know, uh, Europe and especially Germany has a long history of getting uh, its natural resources, its energy, specifically natural gas, from Russia. This is nothing historically um, any different than what's been happening before. There's already a pipeline that runs from Russia to Germany. Um, the issue is more that, um, you know, what does Russia want for this? And I think Russia, uh, there's a clear idea that they are trying to meddle politically. Uh, trying to gain more political, geopolitical influence over Europe and the region, and potentially trying to cause mischief um, with Ukraine um, in the process. But um, that's, uh, in a sense, it is all a, a hypothetical. They, this, this is a business arrangement, and yes, um, they, they are a, a business partner and can do, can do anything down the line. But is there really any uh, uh, um, evidence to show that, that this is a move that, that, that Russia might use it for nefarious purposes in the future? I mean, all you have to think about is the history of Russia's relationship and its actions with respect to Ukraine. Um, if it has the opportunity to cause mischief and to undermine that regime, a regime that's been uh, notoriously... Uh, you know, opposed to the Russian regime and to destabilize not only Europe, but the Western alliance, it'll do that. And it is, and this is definitely something that has that potential. It's already dividing Central and Eastern European partners of the United States, the United States and Germany. And so they're already having, they're already bearing the fruits of, uh, of, of this project in a sense. And so, uh, you know, Russia has always, you know, um, has, has, has demonstrated that it is, it is willing and able to try to do these types of things. And this will give it even more opportunity beyond cyber and, and the other ways in which it has interfered in these relationships and trying to drive a wedge between partners um, moving forward. As you say, there's, there's disagreement between Germany and the United States over this. So a wedge is being pushed between them in, in, in a sense. Uh, Angela Merkel is very supportive of this project. Um, her country is one of those that stands to, to benefit from it. The United States is out of, this, out of the orbit and, from an energy perspective, has nothing to gain or lose. So, uh, really, is it, is it something that the United States should be, um, should be telling the Europeans, uh, find your energy from other sources? You know, whether that should or shouldn't be in terms of national sovereignty is another question. Um, in terms of geopolitics and the fact that, you know, the United States, in it is in, it's in our interest and in the interest of the Western alliance to keep our partners together mm -hmm. and, in a sense, to isolate uh, Russia. And so I think in, in that sense, the United States feels that it has a right and an obligation, uh, especially because it, it, is, it has a big stake in the security of Europe uh, to intercede in these types of uh, projects that could destabilize uh, that situation. Right. So uh, like an elder brother overlooking and, and taking care of, uh, of its siblings. Of course, um, locally, one of the countries that, that is affected by Nord Stream because, because it bypasses it um, is Ukraine. Um, and so from the Ukrainian perspective, yes, we understand the, um, the, the Russians are posturing on the border of Ukraine and putting pressure on the country. Uh, from, from their perspective, um, this... Uh, um, the, this note of caution from the United States must be uh, very welcome. From the Ukrainian perspective, yes. or from the Russian? yes, from the Ukrainian perspective. From the, from the Ukrainian perspective, I think this the agreement that they just hatched, I think, uh, is very concerning. Um, the Ukrainians are very vulnerable to the Russians, um, as you all know. That you know the 
they already have Crimea as being, you know, occupied by the Russian government. There's a lot of pressure and a lot of nefarious behavior going on on the Eastern Front within Ukraine. And, you know, Ukraine is just concerned and wants to make sure that the Western alliance, and of course it's not in NATO yet, um, has its back. And uh, con it's concerning that Joe Biden, in a sense, has to some extent turned its back on Ukraine and puts it in a much more precarious position or much more vulnerable position. Ukraine does not want uh, Vladimir Putin to to think that, you know what, the United States is going to allow Russia to do these types of things and maybe to go ahead and and uh, and do and, and carry out more malign actions within Ukraine or even take up more territory. And so it does put Ukraine in a much more precarious national security situation. Now, under uh, Donald Trump, the administration was very anti uh, the, the Nord II. Uh, as we've just, as you just mentioned, Biden has taken a different view. Um, what what is the deal that uh, that uh, Biden has allowed to proceed? You know, I think the overall position is generally the same. The issue is that when Biden came into office, over ninety percent of the pipeline was already built, and he's taking a little bit more of a pragmatic approach. Right. At this point, ninety-eight percent of the pipeline is is built, and I'm not sure if he thinks that at this point, sanctions on Germany and German companies or you know actors could actually derail the project. Uh, on the other hand, Biden is very, very interested in rebuilding the North Atlantic Alliance, specifically with Germany. Mm. Um, there are a number of projects, including the Iranian nuclear deal, and especially with China, where the United States really does need and want a united American European front. Um, that's very important. In addition to that, Germany also already has sanctions placed on uh, Russia that are very important uh, to containing Russia, specifically uh, in response to the Crimea issue and to the Navalny issue. And so the United States doesn't want to you know, undo some of those because it's pressed too hard in a situation where it probably couldn't get Germany uh, to ditch the deal anyway. And so I think in a way it's a very pragmatic call. You know, that said, uh, you know, I think the critics would say that there's just no teeth to this deal. There's no specifics to the deal. And that's very problematic. That could just be indicative of the fact that it's pretty much done at this point. Uh, what we're seeing, uh, what we're uh, uh, understanding more and more every day is that sometimes the administration isn't uh, in concert with the, with the Senate or Congress. Uh, what, what's, the, um, what's the perspective from those two bodies uh, to this? Are they coming out strongly critical of Biden or are they supportive? Well, the Congress has a long history of supporting increased sanctions uh, on Russia with respect to Ukraine and the Nord Stream 2 pipeline. And so, uh, as you could expect, a number of congressional leaders, specifically Republicans, but also some Democrats, have come out and criticized and, um, you know, the, the position, the new deal that the United States struck with Germany as being weak in that sense. And so, you know, that said, the president in the United States at this point assumes most of the responsibility of foreign affairs. Um, you could see some sanctions potentially working its way through Congress, but I'm not sure that's going to happen necessarily, um, given the fact that it is uh, Congress is controlled by the Democrats. Now, as, as you say, Joe Biden's taken a very pragmatic approach. The, the pipeline is almost finished. Um, but if bodies in, in the U.S. Are, uh, are highly critical of, of, of this stance, what would their solutions be, do you think? Do they have alternatives? After all, European countries need this energy. Um, and in a sense, this is something that has to go forward in order for them to, to have gas in their pipes. But that's one convenient thing about not being in charge of foreign policy and right. being able to criticize it. Um, and so I'm not sure besides levying additional sanctions on Germany, German companies, et cetera, to try to derail this, I'm not sure they've thought about steps two, three, and four. Right. And so I think the Biden administration is just trying to deal with the situation at hand, um, you know, whether or not it could have actually pushed a little harder for more specifics in terms of what types of sanctions Germany would levy if Russia uh, did actually... Uh, undertake some malign actions, did actually try to cut off energy 
uh, to Ukraine, did not actually use Ukraine as a pass-through moving forward um, and, and pay those rights. Um, those are not specified, and, and maybe I think that's where the critics uh, actually, you know, have a, have a very uh, good case. Now, um, many of these critics also fear that um, the pipeline is giving Russia too much power over Europe. But in the previous administration, we saw in, in a very real sense the Trump administration um, withdrawing from, uh, from the European theatre by, um, by perhaps destabilising relationships within NATO um, and picking arguments where they didn't need to be. Uh, so... Um, this is perhaps, is, is this deal one of the ways of rebuilding that relationship so that, um, so that the American can say, yes, we're still alongside our longstanding European allies? I mean, to some extent, I think this deal is just in response to the fact that countries like Germany and uh, others within the European alliance, uh, because of the Trump administration's responses and actions, felt like, you know, they might have been stranded away from the United States and had to undertake actions to create their own energy in independence and other ways of securing itself. And so in a way, Biden's in a way having to pick up the pieces of the very kind of, you know, contradictory and misconstrued kind of foreign policy with respect to uh, our European partners. And, uh, you know, the, the response is, unfortunately, it's, it's a choice between a not so great choice and a bad choice. And, and so there, he's just trying to, trying to, trying to, you know, repair this relationship so that the more important foreign policy decisions and issues such as China, um, that the United States can actually be in a stronger position. Um, not that this is an important, uh, but this is probably to him less important. So this um, this agreement uh, is a, a fudging of the situation in a sense, allowing it to move forward while still uh, saying we're not happy about it. So in in a sense, it, there, there's no clear win either for the United States or, or for for Germany and uh, and others involved in the project. Um, so how does um, how does this move us forward in the future? Do you think with policy towards Russia? Yeah, I'm not really sure. And I would actually take a little bit of an exception with your characterization. I think this is a huge win for Angela Merkel, right? Um, in the sense that she actually got what she wanted largely and had to concede very little. Um, moving forward with Russia. I think uh, Biden is just trying to rebuild a relationship from which it can, or a foundational relationship with his uh, Western European allies so that we could actually act in unison. I think it's going to take a lot of cleanup like these types of actions here before he can actually launch that kind of an offensive. But I think that's what he's trying to do is trying to shore up uh, the alliance at this point and then move forward. Now, the other interesting thing is that Angela Merkel soon will no longer be the Chancellor of Germany, and there are other parties in Germany, such as the Green Party, who aren't so supportive of, of Nord Stream. Is this going to change the calculus in the future? I mean, very well could. We're not sure what's going to happen in the upcoming elections. Of course, it, it, it looks likely that the Green Party is definitely going to um, receive a larger share of, of the seats and the votes, and, and will if not gain the chancellorship, at least gain some cabinet ministries. Um, I'm not sure Biden's thought that far yet and wanted to deal with the situation as he sees now because he is trying to not have to wait until the late fall to, to start a lot of his foreign policy initiatives. Um, but he'll deal with that, um, you know, when he deals with that. <laughs> right, indeed. Now, uh, very shortly, the Ukrainian president, Vladimir Zelensky, is going to be visiting Washington. Um, and coming after th this deal, I I'm sure, uh, sure that he'll be seeking reassurances from the U.S. government that, uh, that it really is strongly behind Ukraine. What, what do you think that that meeting will bring? I mean, I, I think what the Euro Ukrainians and I think exactly what the United States wants to get out of that meeting is a very public, symbolic show of support for the Ukrainians by the United States government. I think there needs to be some concrete actions that are announced there to remind Russia that the United States is not backing off its commitment to defend and to help Ukraine, but it's just as strong now as it's ever been. I think that's going to be really important. I think that's something that the Ukrainians are going to want to get out of this, uh, out of this uh, meeting with uh, President Biden. Absolutely. 
Well, Chris, thank you so much for your analysis. Um, it's a very complicated situation. Uh, thank you for joining us today here on The Edge and explaining it for us. Thank you. Uh, the Kremlin gave a mixed welcome to the US-German deal, saying that it disagreed with some of the language used about Russia and that Moscow had never used energy as a geopolitical weapon. Nord Stream 2 should be finished late in August and enter service later this year. The coming days will show the effects of the agreement. For now, let's move to our next topic to speak about Afghanistan's security. The withdrawal of U.S. troops from Afghanistan plays an important factor in the Afghan peace process. Our following infographic gives an overview of the U.S. troops' presence in Afghanistan. Taliban spokesman Suhail Shaheen has laid out the insurgent stance on what should come next in Afghanistan, calling for a new government to reach sustainable peace in the country. Two decades of conflict have taken a turn for the worse as US-led international forces withdraw from Afghanistan. Taliban has launched offensives around the war-torn country, taking districts and border crossings while encircling provincial capitals. I want to make it clear that we do not believe in the monopoly of power because uh, any government who monopolized power in Afghanistan in the past, they were not uh, successful governments. So we do not want to repeat that uh, failed formula. Memories of the Taliban's last time in power some 20 years ago have stoked fears of their return among many. Afghans who can afford it are applying by the thousands for visas to leave Afghanistan, fearing a violent descent into chaos. Government and Taliban negotiators have been meeting in Qatar's capital, Doha, since last September. But they failed to make substantive progress with time running out before the foreign troops fully exit by the 11th of September. They want not want reconciliation, but they want surrendering. They want come uh, uh, come and have a ceasefire, and we will continue our government as it is. So that's also not a realistic approach not um, pragmatic approach. It is necessary that all Afghans should have or should agree upon a new government and that government would replace the new, this Kabul administration. And that government will be uh, uh, acceptable to us and to other Afghans. And I'm joined live from Ankara in Turkey by Gal Luft, who's a security analyst and professor with Austin Technik University. Gal, thank you for joining us again here today on The Edge. Afghanistan, no one wants a civil war in Afghanistan. Everybody wants peace. But the Taliban are marching on day by day, taking more and more districts across the country as the U.S. forces withdraw. And that's going to be completed, that withdrawal will be completed uh, within the next month. Uh, what, what is the current situation from your perspective in Afghanistan? Well, the uh, withdrawal is 95% completed. Um, now the game is the Afghan army versus the Taliban with a little bit of support 
by uh, U.S. and NATO forces from the air, mainly, uh, through the use of drones. Uh, but that doesn't have much of an impact. Uh, the Taliban still has the momentum. What I think their strategy is, is to wait on Kabul. I don't think that they want to march on Kabul, because that will put the responsibility of gover governing the country on them. And I I'm not sure that this is what they want to achieve at the moment. But what they want to do is to encircle Kabul, uh, take control over uh, all the provinces and districts in the north east of Kabul, and then take over Kandahar, which is in south uh, southwest of, of, of Kabul, and uh, Mazara Sharif. So in other words, taking all the surrounding cities and districts around Kabul, and even part of the Kabul district itself, but not the actual city, not the actual uh, capital and the government institution. That will be waiting for later. They want to signal to the current Afghan uh, government, we can march on Kabul. You're probably not going to be able to stop us. Uh, let's reach a deal uh, before, uh, in order to, to, to prevent this. And um, the issue is that when you are talking about, uh, you, you mentioned uh, everybody wants peace. Yes, uh, it's always true, but under what terms? Mm -hmm. What does this peace look like? And more important, what would be the face or the, the nature of uh, the government of, of, of this country. And uh, it will take a long time to achieve uh, the understandings on this. I was quite disturbed by the fact that even during the holiday, the Eid al-Adha holiday, they could not even agree on a ceasefire. Right. Um, so that is actually uh, uh, not a very good sign. And I think um, it will take a while to play out, certainly... Uh, not before um, the August 31st uh, withdrawal, complete withdrawal of the U.S., and we will see how it plays out. There's a lot of negotiations that need to, and a lot of understanding that need to be reached. And in fact, in, in similar circumstances in the past, uh, when there has been a religious holiday, the Taliban have, uh, have stood down temporarily. But th th this is, uh, e even the um, uh, U.S. General Mark Miley has described the, the Taliban having a strategic momentum. So what one imagines that the reason that they didn't stand down was they want to maintain this, uh, this momentum. Is it, um, if they're not um, um, militarily claiming land um, and taking land, the, the, the Taliban themselves say that they, the, most of the places that they've, they've taken have been through agreements with local tribesmen and the local communities to, to move on, rather than, um, rather than taking them by an offensive. Um, is there the sense that, that the Taliban, in, in many ways, are unstoppable at this time? Well, there are two ways of looking at this. One way you can look at it is the Taliban is on a roll and they're unstoppable. The other way to look at it is the Afghan army, the Afghan national security forces are um, not putting um, a real fight. They're not doing what they have been trained to do. Right. Um, they are disappointing. Uh, so I don't know if what we're seeing today is more of a, a Taliban being on a, on a roll or really um, a complete failure of the, the Afghan military. Now, granted, there are some real problems there, because what are the Taliban... Um, they, they took over the, the main uh, roads in the country, so it's very difficult to move forces. And the only thing that stands for the Afghan army is their ability to control the air. And much of what we will see in the next several weeks and months is uh, has to do with the ability of the Afghan Air Force to maintain its capabilities. Um, they have well over 100 aircraft and helicopters. They, they will play a very important role uh, because that's the only way uh, to move forces and supply uh, from, from one place to another. Right. And the question is whether uh, the Afghan Air Force will have the logistical support, the technical support, and uh, uh, the fuel, the, the ammunition 
to maintain control over the air. And of course, as you said, there's a very uh, serious issue with, with roads being closed that cities like Kabul uh, don't just need uh, the, the, uh, the air supremacy or whatever. It isn't just necessary from a military perspective, but also to keep these remaining uh, regions or cities functioning. They, they need supplies of medicines, of food, of, of, of daily goods. So there's a very real sense of siege being built up across the country. It is true. There is a, a siege over the capital for sure. Um, and right now, uh, the institutions of government are still operating. They're still uh, functioning. How long will the central government be able to extend its reach and, and take care of the more distant provinces? Uh, without having the ability to move around, to supply, to, to, to even go visit. You know, if you're, if you're a cabinet minister and you want to go visit one of the provinces, uh, mm -hmm. the only way to do it is, is fly there on a helicopter. But that's only if you're a government, a senior government official. But if you are just a local aid worker and you want to do it, you're not going to get a helicopter to uh, shuttle you around. So. Sure. Uh, the ability of the central government to take uh, care of the people in the more distant provinces is severely curtailed. And uh, the, those local populations will grow increasingly dependent on the Taliban. And the question is whether the Taliban will be able to, uh, to deliver. Uh, well, the Taliban now is, has an independent source of wealth. Uh, they control the border crossing so they can collect uh, custom duties and, and generate some revenue with which they can um, perform different services. Uh, but that's not a sustainable situation. Uh, and uh, unless there's some unity uh, that occurs in the next um, uh, several months, I'm afraid that there is a very good chance that the, the entire country uh, will be dismembered and mm -hmm. go back to what it used to be. And, and in connection with that, one from the just just before we started speaking, we were hearing some statements from from the Taliban spokesman by, from Suhail Shaheen, and he, he made some interesting remarks. Um, he, for example, the Taliban will lay down weapons when a negotiated government acceptable to all sides in the conflict is installed in Kabul, and Ghani's government is gone. They, they, they have a particular focus on getting rid of President Ghani but also saying we don't believe in a monopoly of power. They don't, they're saying that they don't want to go back to 20 years ago um, when, when they were last in power. They, they want to, uh, well, from what I understand, they want to have a power-sharing um, government in the country. Is that realistic? Well, I, I think just to use an analogy, I think what they want to be is a, a, another version of Hezbollah. Um, in other words, they want to have the arms, they want to have their, their, their military capabilities, they want to be part of the uh, governing. They're not sure that they want to be in charge because that brings a lot of uh, challenges and, mm -hmm. and issues of performance. Uh, and what I think they're aiming for is, is a similar model in which there's some division of power, but at the same time, uh, they, they will not agree to disarm. And what we will see is a similar situation that we've been witnessing in Lebanon, in which there is a, um, a country within a country, uh, an army within an army. And we see the results today with Lebanon is essentially, you know, breaking apart. And, and, and that's not a model that uh, uh, is conducive to long-term peace and stability. Now, we've seen that uh, talks have been held in Qatar so, uh, since last September. Uh, nothing particular has, has come out of those. The, the talks just go on from meeting to meeting uh, and so forth. But uh, is there a sense that the, the, the Taliban might, uh, in, in the near future, negotiate? They're, they're saying, again, in this same statement from, uh, from, uh, from Suhail Shaheen, uh, no one wants a civil war, including me, he says. Uh, the, 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 are they prepared to work for peace? Or is this just a sham? I think, look, of course, nobody wants a war, nobody wants civil war. That's the oldest adage in the, in, in the book. 
but uh, also nobody wants to accept the other side's model of governance. Um, the, there's a religious element there or their uh, interpretation of how they want to see society functioning. Uh, these issues are not really, um, you know, I don't see how they can reconcile all these differences. And what worries me is that there is no um, power uh, or outside power. I mean, Qatar is great. They're, they're hosting a very important set of meetings, but Qatar does not have leverage. Right. Um, um, the Americans don't have leverage. The Europeans don't have leverage. Um, the Russians have some leverage, but not a lot. The only country that is really um, cultivating relations with the Taliban now and has good dialogue with the Taliban is China. And I think what China will be doing is very important. Uh, Turkey, there's a whole question about what will happen with Turkey's presence there at the international airport. I don't think that the Taliban will live well with uh, this uh, arrangement of uh, Turkey controlling the international airport. Uh, so really, <clears throat> I think that what will happen uh, will depend a lot on, on China, on Pakistan, perhaps, um, even a little bit of India. Uh, Iran will have a say. Um, but uh, there needs to be some um, outside powers that um, to usher a deal and to, to be um, mediators here, uh, because if the two sides just talk to each other, um, across a, a very large table, as we've seen, mm. uh, that alone is not going to do the trick. Is there a sense then, from what you're saying, that uh, very urgently the international community needs to uh, somehow participate in some forum to, uh, to encourage all uh, sides, because I'm sure it's not just the Taliban and the government in, in Afghanistan, there are, there are other tribal groups as well. Uh, is, is there a sense that the international community needs to try and find, help them to find some consensus? Well, I don't really like the word international community because sure. um, I always run for the exit when I hear this <laughs> term because I know what it means. But I think you really need some sort of uh, honest broker here uh, that has an interest, uh, really serious interest in, in stability. I think China is a good candidate for it because China also has an interest in making sure that uh, the, the violence and the, 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 the extremists don't spill into its um, western province of Xinjiang. Um, um, they are more or less one of the few um, players that has uh, relatively good dialogue with the Taliban. Uh, everybody is talking to the Afghan government, but that's not a big deal. You know, uh, the question who's talking, who's influencing the Taliban? Mm. And I think China is, is, is the only power that really has a, a leverage and, and also some influence over, over the Taliban. I hope that the Chinese will become more involved in this and probably other nations as well. But I don't think that it, we need to sit and wait for the sort of international community to get its act together. It will take too long and will be too cumbersome. Um, we just need one or two uh, responsible adults in the room uh, with some leverage and a set of carrots and sticks. And maybe that will uh, get the parts to come to their senses. Of course, the big challenge there is finding the responsible adults in the room in this crazy world of politics. Galuft, uh, the Afghan story continues. Um, the, the people continue to suffer. And at the end of the day, it's for their peace that everybody must work. Thank you so much for joining us here today on The Edge. Let's hope that uh, in the coming days, uh, things begin to take a different course. Uh, U.S. President Joe Biden has announced that he's pulling out all U.S. troops by August. And American forces have already left their main base in the country. In recent days, the Taliban have taken more and more regions. The coming weeks will indeed show if the crisis deepens further after their complete withdrawal. Now, our analysts have provided their insights on today's top stories. Let's have a roundup of what they had to say.
Let's now take a look at social media to hear your voices and reactions on today's top story. Share it with the hashtag Nord Stream 2. Here's what you've been having to say on Nord Stream 2 on Twitter. Howard J. Chat says the United States clears the way for completion of Russia Germany Nord Stream 2 gas pipeline, now in return for various commitments in the future. Gamal Shetty says. It's possible Ukraine might experience greater risk about Russian gas supply if Nord Stream 2 gas pipeline project is not completed due to US opposition, supplying gas to Germany and some other EU countries. And Mick Marco asks, how would we feel if the Germans threatened to have sanctions against us if we made a deal with Canada for a natural gas pipeline going from Canada to the United States? Wouldn't we tell Germany to stay out of it? Seems like we're trying to bully our friends. Let's take a look at our video of the day, which tells the story of refugee Dukoda Sander Aldas, who's qualified for the Tokyo 2020 Olympic Games. Sport is my life. I did it for a long time, so it's literally all my life, not a, a part of my life. I started doing judo since I was seven, and then after that it became all my life. I cannot participate for my country. I also cannot participate for the for Netherlands. I'm so glad that, that the IOC and the International Judo Federation could have solved this problem because now we can play for the refugee Olympic team itself and then to follow our dreams, you know. I came here in 2015 uh, because of the situation in my country. I came first and then my husband and uh, my kid came with the family reunion. Uh, me and my husband did judo for a long time and when we came here we couldn't get that help to, uh, to start judo. We didn't have that much support here. Until 2019, the competition manager from the International Judo Federation got in contact with my coach and she told him that uh, we can uh, join the International Judo Federation uh, support, support uh, program. And uh, then, how, this is in shortcuts how we started it. <laughs> Actually, here in this country, respect refugees so much, but to have a refugee who will maybe participate in the Olympic Games, then uh, everyone will look to you differently, everyone will salute you, will be happy to know you, and we're happy like now we can fit more in the society, not being looked only as refugees, because in every country you have people who will say refugees and they support you and say refugee, then they like look to you in a terrible way. So most of people, uh, we are surrounded by good and nice people now. And uh, yeah, it, it gives us a big motivation to, to, to achieve a high goal. so difficult to start everything all, all over again since we came here, but uh, sport gave us a, a big motivation, a big goal to follow, and now we're following this goal. We cannot just stop because we, we don't have a country to present by the Olympics, and now this huge step, we can be a part of the Olympic itself, then it's something great. That brings us nearly to the end of this 100th episode of The Edge. But before closing today's programme, here's a short overview of the first season, in which we heard from 141 different analysts making 306 guest appearances. 
I particularly want to thank them for their expert insights. Here's a short overview of the first season. Black Lives Matter, I Can't Breathe, We Want Justice, Silence is Violence. These are not only slogans, but also the sound of a revolt against police violence in the United States following the killing of a 46-year-old black man in May 2020. I'm Arthur Lubar. Thank you for joining me here today on The Edge. I'm fine, thank you. We've just been looking at the how the um, PKK is financed from drugs, but also uh, I believe that the HTP has also used taxpayers' money and funneled that, that towards the PKK. And then what Egypt wants is to control the water, the dams that we built by our own resources. She does not Let share any pain. Mokhtar, 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 can, we, can we just put Mokhtar cut in just for a moment? Mokhtar. Sir, I'm sorry to tell you that what you are saying doesn't make any sense. You had to say on Twitter about stopping executions in Egypt. Almain de Rochebrun says, will Joseph Burrell or Secretary uh, Blinken or the President of the United States or Emmanuel Macron denounce the massacre? Let's now take a look at our video of the day, which shows the first five countries hosting the most refugees. A small fraction of the nation's military under the command of the Gulenist terror group staged a heinous coup attempt with a barbaric aim to destroy modern Turkish democracy and install a dictatorship instead. Yet what the terrorists had not anticipated was all of Turkey taking to the streets to defend exactly that, their democracy. Israel's actions have accelerated, as we have noticed. They they started like if they were doing A and B, now they're doing C until F maybe or until even Z. They are on the way to achieving the purpose and achieving the goals of this apartheid regime. The, obviously there's going to be tremendous amount of investigation into that. The United Nations and, and others are uh, saying that, that war crimes were committed during that conflict by both sides, but, but uh, particularly uh, from the targeting of civilian buildings and uh, medical centers uh, in, in Gaza. So uh, obviously the, your information sources um, have been rather selected. Well, Sheikh uh, Ekrima Sabri, uh, we hope that uh, peace returns to the Palestinians, that they receive their rights, uh, and we wish you uh, best wishes during the holy month of Ramadan. Thank you so much for joining us today and sharing your, your wisdom with us here on The Edge. I'm very much appreciated. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much, thank you, thank you so much for making, giving me this chance to speak through your screen. Thank you so much. Great pleasure, thank you. Apart from the invaluable perspectives from Beyond the Edge made by our guests, none of this would be possible without the stellar preparation of our team working on the program behind the scenes. After 100 episodes, it's time for their moments in the spotlight. So I'd like to introduce you to my great team who stop us from falling off the edge. On ANUS, we want to create a program which not only gives the main facts, facts about a current problem, but also shows the different facets of the topic in order to give our audience whole story and not just an overview. While producing the program, I wanted to reach people all around the world and try to be their voice to express their problems, including Palestinians, Syrians, or people who face racism no matter where. In order to do so, we brought the stories to our audience without changing the reality. Instead, we gave a deep insight into the main cause of the problem, and our guests from all around the world gave their perspectives. The Age is one of the tasks that made me happy. Yeah, it's a very important program on A News. And the reason of its success is that there is a really integrated team which always works together. 
the combination of the technical vision with good preparation and uh, continuous follow-up of the events with a professional presenter and great guests were the most important factors of our success. At A News, we are already getting ready for the next season to bring you a fresh look at the news and we'll continue to bring you the current top topics by looking beyond the edge. And that's all for this 100th episode of The Edge with me, Andy Boynes. Stay tuned as we'll be back in the autumn after a short break with more in-depth analysis on the top stories and a look beyond the edge.